All right, well, it is 12 o'clock, so I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Tabby Flynn, and I'm the Vigo County um, Purdue Extension a &R educator. And before we get too far into the bean presentation, um, I want to share with you guys some things. Uh, so this jar of beans that I have here, um, these have been passed down in my mom's side of the family for years and years. And I asked my grandma if I could have some because I have a really nice garden spot now. So she got them out of the freezer. Um, they were labeled 1985. So that's the last time that she planted them and kept seeds. So I was a little hesitant uh, that they would even grow. And I got impatient in the middle of winter. And so I planted one and lo and behold, they still grow. So I'm really excited about the beans that I get to put in the ground this year. It's still a little too cold. Um, so in a couple weeks, I'll be getting my beans out. All right, so today we're gonna talk about best practices for beans and peas. We've already kind of covered um, the educators in the area. Here's the list for those of you that don't know your local educators. Uh, feel free to reach out to any of us with any questions you might have. So peas and beans, uh, we'll go over some basics. They're all in the same family and that's the base -y. And they're also known as legumes. There are 19,000 known species and they can be in a different variety of shapes and um, structures. So we have trees and shrubs, and we have annual or perennial herbaceous plants. Uh, so some of the trees that you might be familiar with are the mimosa trees. So those are in the same family as beans that you eat out of your garden. And a lot of the names are based on the style of growth. So we call them pole beans because they grow up a pole. Um, we call them bush beans because they kind of stay in a bush shape. And we'll talk a little bit more about those later on. But some of the ones that we're most familiar with, soybeans, chickpeas, peas, green beans, wax beans, alfalfa, and peanuts. They're all in the same family. Up first, we're gonna talk about peas. Uh, this is their, the most common species we have listed up here. Uh, there are a couple other species that we use in varieties, but that's the most common one you're gonna find um, in the garden center. And these grow in pods. So you can see we've got some cracked open over here. This is what they look like um, on the inside when they're growing. They can be yellow or green in color. Those are the two most common. And they're a cool season crop. So they do really well in spring. They do really well later in the fall. You wanna plant when the soil temperature reaches about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and these are gonna be the earliest bees, beans or peas in this family that you can put into the garden. Um, so I put mine in last week. They're already starting to break the ground. So I'm excited for my peas to get going. These are a vining plant. So you'll need something for them to grow on. And here are some examples of different growing structures. Uh, the most common one that people use is they'll just get sticks from the woods, um, stake them in the ground. Uh, there's also people who make, uh, this one right here is fencing. This is how I've got mine growing. I've got a piece of fence that I just stuck in between two rows of, of peas so that they can grow up it. Um, they can trellis on twine. So if you have limited space, you can just grow them straight up. And then um, the other option over here is kind of like a mesh made out of those wooden poles. It's really however you want to grow them. There are infinite ways to do it. Up next are the bush beans. And this is again, the most common species that we, we use. They also form in pods. They can be green, yellow, purple. Uh, there's a lot more variety in color with bush beans. Um, so unlike the peas, these are a little bit more of a warm season crop. So you don't want to plant them until the soil temperature reaches about 65 to 70 degrees. So I haven't put any of my beans in yet. Um, and I forgot to mention with the peas, all of these do best when they're directly sown. So they're not really good for starting inside and then moving outside. Um, you wanna plant them directly into where they're gonna be growing. So what's cool about bush beans is that they're one of the species with determinate growth. And that means that the plant is gonna grow, it's gonna to get to a certain size, um, in adulthood stage, and then it's not gonna get any bigger. So you can kind of know how, how far apart to space them, you know, how many you can fit into a spot because you know how big they're gonna get. They're usually less than two feet around um, if they're fertilized really well. And they'll be mature in 50 to 60 days after you plant. And as uh, an example here of the different colors, there are lots of really cool bush beans. Um, I I think I just got green and, and the yellow wax beans this year, but I can't remember what all I bought. 
And then we're going to talk about pole beans. And pole beans are called pole beans because they're going to grow up a pole. They're also called runners. Um, they can go across the ground, but they do best when they're growing up. So these guys form in, in pods. Um, they can be yellow, green, red, purple, just like the bush beans. There's a ton of variety in color and size and shape. Um, the ones that I have are a mix of colors. There's some browns, some blues, some reds. Uh, there's just a ton of different colors you can get. This is another warm season crop, so you don't want to put it in again until it's 65 or 70 degrees in the soil. And they'll be mature in about 50 to 70 days. And because this is a vining plant, just like the peas, we need something for it to grow on. And here's an example of some of the ways people grow them. Um, you can make little teepees and grow them up that way. If they get too long, um, you can start putting strings between the teepees and they'll run across those. So within the beans, um, there's a ton of variety and we kind of break it down into what we use the beans for. So snap beans are the green beans and the wax beans, the ones that you're eating fresh out of the garden. Um, you can get spring peas, those are not really included in there, but snap peas as well. And then there are the shelling ones. That means that the pods get really tough, so we only eat the seeds. We have dry beans, and that's where you let the pods completely ripen and dry on the vine, and you can store them in the winter um, that way before you shell them. And then we have dual purpose, which means you can eat them as green beans, or you could let them mature and later on use for shelling or drying. And that picture I just thought was cool. That's a really pretty color of beans. I'm not sure if they stay that color when they dry, but I hope that they do. So planting and fertilizing. Um, we wanna make sure we're putting them in after there's no more danger of frost. So we're waiting for that soil temperature to warm up. And we're also waiting so that the plants don't get any sort of frost burn. And for beans and peas, beans and peas, uh, you wanna plant them about an inch deep. So I just use my finger. I know about how, how far my finger will go in for an inch and I'll just poke my holes. And they're gonna be about five inches apart. Um, so when you fertilize beans, what's really cool about them is that they're nitrogen uh, fixers. So you don't need a heavy nitrogen fertilizer, um, a five, 10, 10. So five is the nitrogen number there, a lower amount of nitrogen. And you wanna do it before you plant. So dig a furrow that you're gonna put these in, put it about six inches down in the soil layer and then cover it up and then plant on top. And you really wanna avoid any of the high nitrogen fertilizers. Um, if you give them too much nitrogen, you're gonna get really, really pretty lush green plants with not very many pods on them. Uh, so we try and stay away from the heavy nitrogen fertilizers. If you have really sandy soil, um, you can lose a lot of nutrients after a heavy rain. So what you can do is side dress with ammonium nitrate after a heavy rain, um, and you'll just put that, mix it up, and pour it down next to the plants about three or four inches away from it. You want to make sure you don't get it on the, the leaves because you can um, give them a chemical burn. So we've gone over some bean basics and I know I didn't talk too much about different varieties, but there's just endless numbers of species and different varieties of beans and peas that we can grow, um, but they all have the same pests. So we're going to talk about a couple different types of pests. The first group are the insect pests. And one of the most common ones that we have are aphids, bean leaf beetles, Mexican bean beetles, and caterpillars. So I'm gonna share with you what these guys look like and talk about some control methods. So these are what aphids look like. You're most often gonna find them on the underside of leaves or on that new fresh growth. Um, so if you've got flowers or growing tips of vines, they're gonna be there. Uh, these guys feed by uh, piercing and sucking. So they're piercing through the tissue layer. They're drawing out the nutrients. Uh, what you might notice on the upper side of the leaf, if you're getting brown spotting or it's kind of looks like it's drying out a little early, um, if you flip that leaf over, you'll find aphids. So in this photo, you can see um, lots of different life stages of aphids. They start out very small. Um, they'll get larger. Some have wings. But you're also going to find these white castings of exoskeleton from when they've grown. So another problem you can get with these is they're gonna leave that honeydew behind. Um, so you might see ants running into your garden up and down your plants. They might be collecting that honeydew from the aphids. So that's another good indicator that you have aphids in your garden. 
And something you can use um, that works really well for aphids is an insecticidal soap, or you can just like blast them off with the hose, but they will come back. So you'll have to be diligent about removing aphids. Next up is the bean leaf beetle. And I apologize, this picture is a little blurry. I tried to blow it up um, so you could see them better, but there's a lot of variety in color and patterns of bean leaf beetles. So here are four, these all came out of the same field um, here in Indiana. They can be spotted, they can be striped, they can be solid yellow, they can be red, they can be kind of greenish. Um, so it's kind of difficult to identify what you've got when you do have them, but if you see a beetle that looks this shape and it's in your beans, it's probably a bean leaf beetle. And these guys, um, they feed foliarly, so you're going to notice holes in your leaves. Um, if it gets to um, just the point where your plants have pods on them, they'll also feed a little bit on the pods. Uh, but it, usually they stay on the leaves and they're not too much of a problem unless you've got a heavy infestation. This is the Mexican bean beetle. Um, and this guy is native to Mexico and Central America, but with warmer weather, um, we're having the populations move a little bit further north and um, they overwinter as adults. So they're gonna be out early on your plants. If you put your beans and peas in and you start noticing holes right away, it's probably gonna be these guys. They are in the same family as ladybugs. So they are the same shape as a ladybug. But uh, if you'll look closer to this guy, he's more orange than he is red and he's covered in tiny hairs. So looks like a ladybug, not a ladybug, but we wanna make sure we keep the Mexican bean beetles out. Um, you can remove them by hand. If you've got just a couple, pick them off, you know, kill them, squish them, whatever. Um, but you can also use insecticidal soaps to treat with these guys and as well as uh, the bean beetles that we spoke of just a minute ago. Um, any insecticidal soap will work. Any of those broad spectrum garden um, insecticides like seven will work on these guys. And then caterpillars. There are a lot of different types of caterpillars that will feed on your beans. Um, if they're not doing too much damage, you might not worry about them too much. This is actually the caterpillar of a butterfly. And so butterflies are good pollinators. We might not have a problem with them feeding on the leaves. Uh, the most damage that they're doing is rolling the leaf. So this guy, they're called leaf rollers. They'll roll the leaf over to make themselves a little protective place to hang out. Um, so you might see the edge of your leaf looks kind of torn up and rolled. Um, that's where the caterpillars are hanging out. You might also find caterpillars feeding on the flowering heads and the, the younger shoots of your beans and peas. That's the stuff they really like. Uh, and if you get them later on in this season, they can feed on the beans, but it's very unlikely. So some pests that aren't insects that unfortunately we have in Indiana uh, that will feed on your beans and peas are deer, rabbits, squirrels, chipmunks, groundhogs. If you have a heavy field mouse infestation, they'll be doing it. Sometimes raccoons will feed on them if they're later on in the season and they've got their beans on them. And really there's not much we can do with wildlife. You can cage around your garden so that they can't get in. Uh, if you're noticing it's something like uh, chipmunks or groundhogs, you can try and put some finer mesh around and keep them out. But it can be difficult sometimes to keep these animals away. Um, we did try last year using it was some sort of in animal repellent and it, it worked a little bit, but not very well. The deer still came and ate the beans. Um, so our strategy for controlling them this year was to put fencing around where the beans are gonna be because that seemed to be the thing they went after every year. So now we're going to talk about a couple diseases within beans and peas. There are two different types of blight that beans and peas can get. Um, one is halo blight and the other is common blight. So in this photo, this is common blight. Um, you can see you've got some irregular brown spotting. It starts off looking like a wet spot on the leaf, like maybe it's got something going on there. And then it'll dry out and you'll get these big brown lesions. Halo blight um, looks Kind of similar, except the blight is going to be in circles. So you won't have these big irregular lesions, but you'll have small circles of it. If you use treated seed, a lot of seed comes treated with um, fungicide and it'll work great. You won't have a problem with these. Um, if you're using heirloom or ornamentals or something that doesn't have a treated seed, and we might have to pay a little closer attention, there aren't really any resistant strains of beans for the blights. Um, so 
The best method is to rotate where you plant your beans and peas. So don't plant them in the same spot every year. That's also really good for soil health. It's gonna help um, do some different things for the soil. Next up, we have white mold. White mold is a fungal disease. And what you'll find is that on, you'll find it on the blossom stems and leaves and pods of the plant. So it can be really anywhere. So it's gonna start off looking like a water soaked spot, just like with the blights. And then later you're gonna notice there's some fuzzy white stuff growing. Maybe it's on the pods, maybe it's on the plant itself. Um, and it's gonna take over and kill that section of plant. So if it's happening on the stem, you can lose the whole plant. If it's just on some pods, um, you might be able to pick them off and remove them. There are, and I'm gonna butcher this name, benzim, benzimidazole fungicides uh, that work really well on this stuff. And there's a ton of different products that, are, that have this fungicide in it that you can buy you know, at Lowe's or Menards or wherever. There is one species of bean that is resistant to the white mold. Um, and they're using that strain of bean to remove that gene and trying to insert it into other beans to make more varieties that are resistant. So that's something that's coming up in research. Um, I know they've tried it with a couple of the different species of bush beans. This one here is a pole bean, so it's a vining variety. And it's usually um, more of an ornamental because it has very pretty showy flowers. The hummingbirds love it, so people will plant it in their garden. This third one is called bean anthracnose. This is a fungal disease and it's seed borne. So we get it um, when you get seed that's got some infectant, infected material in it, that's where it can pop up. So the seedlings are gonna sprout up and they're gonna have some dark brown or black spotting on them. And then they're gonna look a little sunken. So you can see what it looks like on the pods over here. It's like a dark lesion kind of sunken down in. So once the plant grows into an adult stage, you're not gonna notice anything about this. The symptoms kind of go into hiding. Um, you might think everything's good, but then when you have beans starting to set up on the crop, you'll notice that they're gonna get these spots. And I know that I've had it in the past um, a couple times, but nothing too serious that I couldn't just control it um, by pulling out a plant. And this is another one that's controlled easily with crop rotation. So don't plant your peas and beans in the same spot every year. Um, if there is anthracnose in the area, it's gonna kind of stay in the soil. And every time you plant, they're gonna be growing through it. Uh, so you'll have a problem. There are tons of resistant varieties for bean anthracnose um, across the board, beans, peas, you know, pole beans, bush beans, there's ugh, hundreds of varieties that are already resistant to this. And there's not a fungicide labeled for it. Um, so it's not one that we can control once it's out in, the, in our garden. Um, if it's there, you'll have to use some sort of cultural control and go out and remove it. So I know my presentation was kind of short today. I am in a sling. I, I've had a hard time uh, one-handed typing. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or uh, discuss any issues that anybody's got going on with their beans. So if anyone has any questions for Tabby, please feel free to type them in the chat box um, and we will help answer those. Has anybody else got their peas out planted yet or have you gotten a jump start on your beans? Oh, so we have a few that have come in. So the first question is, what about Japanese beetles? Any advice? Uh, Japanese beetles are kind of hit or miss and it's the same as it is in field crops. You know, one day they're there, the next day they're gone. So if you're noticing them in your beans, uh, you can go out and spray them with something or you know, hand pick them off if there aren't a ton of them, they might not come back. Um, but if you're noticing a reoccurring problem, those Japanese beetle traps do work really well. You just wanna make sure you put it very far away from the thing you're trying to get them off of because if you put it next to your beans, they're gonna to go to the trap, they're gonna go right to your beans. Um, what about neem oil? Does it work on beans? I don't know the answer to that one. I don't know if any of the other educators on do. It's not one that I'm used very often. I would say I, I don't have experience with neem oil, so I don't know. 
uh, much about that one either. Um, would it help to put some type of netting over plants? As far as keeping um, pests out, definitely. Um, that mm -hmm. netting is going to keep them safe. A lot of times that's enough to deter a deer or any animal. If they have to go through a small hole to get to the food, they don't like that. So any kind of netting would work on those. Okay. Um, do you recommend using inoculant to fix the nitrogen in the beans? I have used it when planted bush beans and edible peas. I uh, often use that as well. I think it's a really good thing for the soil. Um, but my main um, nitrogen fixing is that I'm rotating my crops. So that's what I try and do the most of, but I have used that before and it's pretty effective. So um, there is another question. I'm guessing, it, it, I guess it's more of a statement. If someone's just said that they're not really able to use very many traps because um, it's a community garden where kids are. So what, I guess other all, alternatives do you think might be useful, which I guess would be the netting? Yeah, the netting was probably the best. Mm -hmm. um, I planted peas last week. They're not up yet. I am in very sandy soil in southwest Indiana, and I have had a problem with my garden beans falling over. Any suggestions? Ah, so I am also in the southwest part of the county with the sandy soil, um, so I know exactly what you're talking about. And one really good method for that is to plant them deeper than they should be. And so if we're supposed to go an inch, go down an inch and a half or two inches, that's going to help stabilize the root structure. Another option would be to tarp over um, where you've planted them. So they're only coming up in that one spot um, and their roots can't tip. Okay. Um, for those curious about neem oil, I think Brooke says she's going to look and see if um, there's a publication or something we could send out um, with the recording in regards to neem oil. So I have a question. Any advice on how to make sure that we're getting our structures fully cleaned that our beans were growing on? Ah, that is a good question because you can have bacteria and things like that carry over. Um, so mm -hmm. a good uh, method to do in the fall when you pull all your plants you know, make sure you're taking that whole bean plant out or tilling it under so that it's getting broken down. That's going to help with stuff that's in the ground and already on the plant. But with those structures that you're using to support your pole beans and things like that, you want to make sure that you hose them down really well once you get them out of the garden. Um, I always check very carefully to make sure I don't have any chrysalises or anything hanging on mine because that is a does seem like a popular spot for them to be. But um, the best way is to clean them off in the fall and then let them sit all winter um, in the garden shed or in your garage and that should help limit the amount of stuff that's being carried over year to year. Okay, um, thanks for the suggestions. And then we have another question. Uh, someone's had trouble with green bean seeds not coming up. Do wildlife eat the seeds? What could be the reason that the seeds do not sprout? So there are things like mice, chipmunk, squirrels, they're gonna dig up those seeds and eat them. Um, so if you're checking in the soil, the seeds are gone, some sort of small rodent wildlife is probably coming and eat them. Um, if you're checking the soil and you are finding them though, it could be that you're planting too early with beans, especially um, they're very finicky when they get planted too early in the cold weather. Um, and that can cause some seed rot and things like that. So you wanna make sure you're waiting for that soil temperature to get warm enough. Um, but if you are having problems later on in the year, please contact one of us. We'd love to help you out. And I might add, um, Tabby touched on it at the beginning, but making sure your seeds are still good and yep. will germinate. Um, you can always put a couple in a plastic baggie with some moisture on the piece of paper and set them out in your, your, in your house and see if they germinate after about a week to 10 days, just to get an idea if your seeds are not fresh or not. And if you're carrying over seeds um, year to year, a good place to keep them is in the freezer. Uh, that's gonna extend their life as far as germinating year to year. Um, do you recommend soaking your seeds in water before planting? I don't, but I know that a lot of people do. Um, sometimes that can be an issue if you, again, if you're, the seeds are too wet when they go in the ground, um, they can start, start rotting. Um, I've never soaked mine, so I'm not sure if that's, better than not soaking, but that'd definitely be a cool experiment to try out. Okay, so that's the last of the questions right now. Um, 
but thank you guys, I guess, for joining us. If anyone has any more, feel free to type them in the chat box. Abby or Jenna, have you ever experimented with like the push or pull philosophy of using different like plants in the garden to either be a host so they leave the other plants alone or like, um, you know, certain plants may um, keep the insects from landing there, you know what I'm talking about? Yep, so I do plant my herbs around, scattered around the garden so that they're close enough to a lot of things that insects really um, try and, what's the word I'm looking for? Insects really are attracted to some of the plants in the garden um, and things like garlic, chives, onions, um, those are gonna keep pests away from your plants. So my garlic is not in one plot, it's here and there and kind of scattered around all the beds uh, so that it's helping keep insects away. And then I also plant marigolds and things like that that are natural insect repellents. All right, so um, there's a lot of messages coming in saying thank you, thank you, but we do still have one more question, and that's the netting. Um, does putting the netting over plants impede pollinators? It depends on how small the netting is, um, but it can. If you've got really like fine mesh and you're putting that over, that's definitely going to affect the pollinators coming in. Um, if you're doing it to keep animals away, uh, maybe do it just overnight, or if you're noticing you've got squirrels or something out there, um, that might be more of a problem. But the deer are going to come in in the evenings and the mornings. Um, same with the groundhogs. They're kind of active at those times. They might be out in the middle of the day, but it can definitely affect them. Okay. I'm not seeing any more questions coming in, so... Um... Thank you, Abby, or Tabby, sorry, I said Abby. Thank you, Tabby, for presenting today and um, providing us with some education on beans and peas. Um, thank you guys all for joining us for this week's session. I believe we still have a few more sessions yet to come. And as I'm talking, we still have another question that came in, so we'll go ahead and answer that. And they're wanting to know when you are spraying your structures, do you add bleach to the water? I do. Um, and that's something I forgot to mention. It can help kill things pretty quickly. You just want to make sure you're not spraying it in front of something that you're going to bleach and then notice it later on. <laughs> Might add some um, color or diversity, <laughs> some something distinguishing in your yard if you get the bleach everywhere. So, but all right. Well, thank you guys for joining us. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to your local educator or any of us within Area 5, and we'll be glad to answer your questions. But thank you, Tabby, for presenting again. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.